Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Birdland here in New York City. Trumpeter and musician and educator Nicholas Payton tonight decided to put together a roundtable forum on a series of blogs that he wrote on BAM, Black American Music. And tonight's panelists will break down and analyze how black music roots music including jazz a word which he refuses to use and say has been etched in the american psyche this uh all started from a blog post i did at the end of november um when i said uh, the j word is dead and i'm saying j word because i've taken a 90 day vow of silence <laughs> in support of the cause wait, 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 what is wrong with jazz as a word uh, to me, there's a ne negative historical attachment to it. Uh, if we look back at the first documented recording uh, by the ODJB, the original Dixieland J Word Band, it was a black caricature. It was a white caricaturization of black music, minstrel minstrelsy, and it was a, basically a blackface version of a serious black art of guys like. King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, Freddie Keppard, Jelly Roll Morton, and um, if, if we look at uh, like what is that movie with Al Jolson, the J Word Center, where he does that, <laughs> where he does that famous uh, uh, rendition of uh, Mammy, you know, it, it, it just has too too much negative historical kind of connotations for me to to accept it. And I, I feel like we never named our music that, that as black people. Um, many white musicians, early white musicians, shunned the title. You know, but at, at, at some point it, it caught on. Uh, the 20s was known as uh, the J word age. And that was when uh, the music was at its height of popularity. It completely revolutionized uh, world culture. Um, and it was the first music to really galvanize, be a galvanizing force in, 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 uh, in uh, world media. Um, Louis Armstrong was the world's first pop star. He was the Michael Jackson of his time. No one else at that point had ever had that amount of success um, or, or, or uh, popularity like he did. And, and my goal is to try to strip all of the, 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 the negative part of the history that's associated that's associated with the word because the moment you say that word it, it creates a firestorm of events as evidenced by the fact that we're all here that there was so much tension brought out when I said it's dead like why are we soldiering for a word to me that has served none of the artists in the music no good because the moment you say that word it's okay if there are only two people in the club it's okay if you only sell 50 records it's okay if you only pay the cats $50 like I, that's, that's a colonialist mentality that is not suited for great black art. I just want to do away with that and for once and for all acknowledge it's not about excluding white people or any other race because many people have been great at, at this, this uh, form of communication. But let's understand and acknowledge once and for all this is a black creation that came out of a struggle from Africa to New Orleans in Congo Square where it was the only place pretty much in America where we were allowed to practice our drum and dance and singing rituals on the bambula, which is a drum. The bambula is also the name of a dance. Bam, bula. So that's where it's at. So what is BAM? It's an acronym for Black American Music. And to me, you know, when, when the J word separated itself from all, the, the, that term separated the house and divided things in a way that we don't categorize as. It's, it's somewhat of a European, or European um, way of thinking to, to, to categorize and to say this is what this is because when we look at all great black music there's a certain tribal DNA that exists in all of it. I hear it in Louis Armstrong, I hear it in Duke Ellington, I hear it in Stan Getz, I hear it in A Tribe Called Quest, I hear it in Chet Baker, I hear it in a lot of different types of things. So my, my idea is to bring back all the things together with the J word separate. I mean, it's just like saying, you go in, you say, give me, a, I want a bottle of Perrier. Think you're not drinking water? 
You're drinking water. You're asking for water that somebody has given it a name to. You know, so, so of course, everybody is always on the same page. No artist wants someone who cannot even understand that art to name it, be there a, a, a painter, you know, or a, a poet, a writer, be there a TV personality, whatever. You, you, you don't want someone who really doesn't understand it to name it, you know. To, to me, there are three types of musicians in the world. And I was interested to see who would show up today. There are what I what I call this is my you know opinion. You have house musicians, you have field musicians, and you have free musicians. Okay, so that that just I mean because it's a plantational system. That's where we come from. That's what it is, and. Do you think it's funny that the most successful J-word musicians in the world are house musicians? Well, that's, that's what it's supposed to do. And, and the word itself is separative. If you say reggae, what image comes to mind? If you say country western, what image comes to mind? If you say gospel, if you say rock, if you say jazz, if you say blues, if you say alternative, even alternative has an image. Give me a break. How can alternative have an image? I mean, it's music. That's what it is. So, uh, no. uh, what I like to say is this. To play this music requires, um, obviously if you're going to play an instrument, that's a given. But you have to somehow get the feeling of the music inside of you so you can play it. And in order to do that, you must study the music, listen to it, understand it, read about it, talk to older musicians, talk to your peers, all the things you need to do to study the music. And when you study the music, it becomes quite clear that it is black American music. And my question is, why is that an issue for some people? I mean, to me, that's a beautiful thing. That's like, that's great. It's, it's never, I have been playing this music you know, since I was young, you know, <laughs> girl. And there's never been this in inclusion, exclusion, that's never an issue. And this whole thing has been going on, that's, those have been the questions, you know, why can't we play, or why can't so-and-so play? And that's never been brought up in this whole conversation. And I wonder, with all this back and forth, why no one's bringing it up now, no one's here to discuss the other side. It just that's the thing that you mean. You mean can a white person play black American music? That side of it. Yeah. Well, you know, you read the, the posts, you see that. <laughs> you see niggas being called all kind of stuff. But sure. those people aren't here right now. And uh, I've they always might be here. We might be here. We'll get into a little Q and A later. They might be here. <laughs> but I've always felt that uh, what the music needed was community and uh, dialogue and togetherness, which is always the same old thing, oh, so-and-so can't play shit. That's always the conversation with musicians, which is ridiculous. And the stereotypes, you know, I've heard so much stuff, you know, uh, you know you're Jewish, therefore, make one phone call, you're in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> who, you know, who do I call, first of all? You're born with a black skin, you roll out of the crib playing the blues immediately. I mean, that's all just ridiculous. You have to study the art form. Then you find out, yes, it's black American music, which is a beautiful thing, so for everybody. But to play the music and to bring it to life, you have to put it inside of you. And that's what I miss, is that being the discussion at times. Not like who can, who, who can't, who's allowed, who's not allowed. So I support the band movement completely. It's hard to understand something when there's no word for it, right? And just naming it immediately makes it possible to understand it. It's music. No, no, I, I get that. The, I, music has no words. That's why there's music. But is there <laughs> is there some value in being able to categorize at some level, and maybe this is a horrible question for musicians and a group of journalists would say differently, but is there some value to say, okay, the, we don't want to call it jazz, we want to call it blah, blah, blah. 
And so, you know, I mean, for, just for the mind to understand, okay, they are doing something a little differently than what Snoop Doggy Dogg is doing. But they're not, because we only got 12 notes. I mean, see, but the, the but everybody's brainwashed into seeing that, that, thinking that it's different. It's the same, like, well, you say a white person, well, you know, racism. You say white, people have an image. You say black, people have an image. You say green, you say red, you know, green is the alien, you know. But, but <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's semantics. It, this is music. The earliest musicians were the religious leaders. Mm. How far we've fallen. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a religion to me. Yeah. It's a serious. Go ahead. I, I'd just like to take a little tally here. Uh, can you raise your hand if you used iTunes to effectively buy exactly what you wanted to buy? Don't be scared. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've all, in this room, I, I think I can safely say that all of us uh, at some point, somewhere, used labels to identify exactly what they're trying to get or what they like. Um, because there are differences between uh, brands. You, uh, I mean, the less, uh, the, the less identifiable uh, difference is probably between Pepsi and Coke, <laughs> but I'm talking about very, very different uh, brands. Um, for instance, I'll, I'll bring up a situation. Uh, I was playing in Miami Beach. Um, there was this young group of black men. They were walking by us. We were setting up our instruments. They, they didn't hear anything that we played, but they saw on the sign next to us, the J word said, <laughs> none of y'all, I'm the only one up here using the word that. Okay. Did you say it? I said it. You said it. Right. <laughs> Nicholas looked at me real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean no disrespect. I'm just trying to be clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the J word is on the sign. Um, and immediately, these kids, they, they couldn't have been that much younger than us. We were in high school at the time. And uh, they couldn't have been more than like two or three years younger than us. Immediately, they started making fun of what they thought they were going to hear. They started doing things like, Stop spreading the news. <laughs> they started acting all corny and all this stuff. And, you know, they thought that was what they're gonna hear. We open with "Inner Urge" by Joe Henderson. Now, that's the reason we're here. We're trying to find a more suitable label for this great music that is, uh, for the most part from other people, identified under a very, very arbitrary and disdainful word. That's what we're here for. It's, it's a negative word. And negative words bring negative energies. And that's why I think the music suffers, because of this. The, the word itself, I mean, just like the N-word. It's a negative word. You know, we can do what it do away with that one, we can do also do away with other negative words. And to build on what he said, you said in your in your in your blog post that the word itself is killing the spirit of the music. Uh, yeah, essentially, I mean, because just, just the fact that we're all here about a word speaks of the issue that has been lurking underneath the surface for for a long time. This is not a new argument. This is an argument that has been had for many, many, many years. Yeah, you know. Um, it's just that now I feel we're in a position to actually do something about it. So if we can have a black president, why can't we have a black music? Do you think that it would change your career if the world just suddenly started 
thinking of it as black American music, bam? I, I think something's important that uh, Marcus actually said uh, earlier, something in another panel he was on. No one is on here right now on this panel because we're talking about our career. We're, we're talking, I mean, I mean, I but that part of this it matters. About, we stand at risk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is this is about what yeah. something that we believe in, and I, you don't even know how many African Americans I've had conversations with that are like, "Man, you down with Nick?" You know, I'm like, "Come on, for real? What, you, what, what is this? <laughs> how many phone calls I've gotten before? I mean, you know, I thought my house was gonna be firebombed because I was doing it very long. So this ain't about my career. This is about. I mean, look at Ben Wolf. I'm serious, you know? Ben Wolf sitting on this panel, I don't see too many people like Ben Wolf out there. So my point is, I don't think any of us are out here for a career in advancement. But I mean, if, you know? if, if, you know, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. But will it change your career if we adopt this BAM movement? I, I don't know about changing careers. That, that's not what it's all about. It's about taking control of that which you do. That's what it's about, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a simple thing. You know, I mean, you've got musicians. There's, there's two. You've got musicians, and then you have artists who happen. To, their medium happens to be music, and that's two separate things. Two separate things. Go ahead. You want to get in? Go ahead. I just passed the That was perfect, what he said. I, I do think the, uh, the selling of the music and the music itself are two separate things. You know, the music business and music are so separate that it, sometimes it's hard to put them together in a conversation for me. I mean, the art isn't about selling records. Of course, you know, when you say that, people will say, well, you know, if you don't want to sell records, no one doesn't want to sell records, but it's like, what are you willing to do in order to sell a record? Are you going to do whatever you're told will maybe sell, or maybe not sell, or use the term for the record that may sell? I mean, that's, that's a separate thing. And uh, I think it takes a lot of courage to create music for the sake of art, knowing that you're not going to sell a lot of records, whatever you call it. You know, it's just, if it's sometimes a pure art, it just doesn't sell. So I think this is more about the art of the music than the career aspect. I, I doubt that careers will change based on the name, if you're making pure music. I mean, I like the idea of, of selling records. <laughs> I mean, I'm, no, I'm not going to lie, but I'm not willing to make a record in order to sell. But a musician would. A house musician would. And that's the difference. I, I saw a show last night. I watched Unsung on TV One. Wonderful, wonderful series. But um, they ran a, a show about Phyllis Hyman, who I had the privilege to know very well and work with. And she was a good friend of mine. And, and they were just saying, and also they had a show about Vesta, Vesta Williams. Both of those artists, they were artists. People, the record labels wanted to make them pop. They wanted them to sell all of this. They wanted them to be Whitney Houston. And they refused because they were artists who happened to have their medium as music. Okay, so Whitney was, she said, I'll do it. And she was very successful, as all the house musicians are. Is it necessarily evil to, to <laughs> is it necessarily evil to communicate with a lot of people? Because, I mean, just to dismiss Whitney in particular, as opposed to somebody like I'm not dismissing her. Well, I think you were a little bit. Let me finish. Saying she's out. To, to, to dismiss, <laughs> to, to dismiss him, I mean, like somebody like Britney Spears is. is I'm gonna get you in. It's, it's somebody like Britney Spears is a widget, right? Whitney Houston is an artist, right? I mean, she's got one of the more incredible voices in the world, and she and she really uses it and expounds on her as she used to. I think she could have used it better. You know, I gotta say, Matt, communicating versus having a lot of people hear what you have to say, again, are two different things, I think. You can do something in order to have your voice louder and have more people hear it, or you can try to communicate and maybe get to two or three people. It's kind of like on the bandstand. Do you want to play music that you think the crowd, as if that's one person, are going to like it and start uh, shaking, you know, 
standing up, standing ovation, or you're going to try to play some honest music that perhaps they will like or not like, be moved or not be moved, and give them the choice. Create some music that you believe in and put it out there and see what happens. Give the audience the choice. Versus like, okay, if I do this, you know, if I spin the bass or whatever, they're going to... Which I did once, you know. I'm not going to lie, I did it once. And, and all of a sudden, I'm a bad cat that spun the bass. I'm saying I lied, you know. But, I mean, it's like two different things. You want to reach... Well, why can't you do both? I mean... You can do both, you can and that's both. what we're saying. I, I, but if you're if you're in a box that these people say you're in, and you get outside that box, they're right on your case. I agree. It's being honest, you know. Do what you actually do, whatever that is, versus doing what you think you're supposed to do in order to whatever. And that's not what you really believe in. I mean, I think it's integrity and intent and being honest. And if you honestly just want to sell a bunch of records and do whatever that takes. Then go ahead and say that. You know what? I'm gonna do this thing. You know, it's. I know people might like it, and I'll make a lot of money. That's what I'm doing. Versus claiming to be an artist and just trying to sell some records. See, I hear a lot of bashing of the concept of trying to sell records, and in your post, you specifically said there's nothing romantic about a poor J word. You I, don't no I don't think it's in bashing, right? It's not like bad. nobody no? bashing. Not bad. The, the, no, I don't think so. Okay. We're just distinct. We're bringing up the, the differences, but we're not bashing them. It's you know? I, I don't hear a distinction between artists who sell a lot of records and remain free musicians because they can't. They can't. <laughs> They're not free. They're under contract. <laughs> I want to. I want to. That's what they call slavery nowadays under contract. I want to. Uh, I want to get some questions from y'all so we get some more flavor. But let me. Let me. Let me get. Let me get Nicholas to unpack one thing and then we we'll start taking questions. Because um, one of the more provocative things that you said in your piece that I loved was that silence is music. Unpack that for us, please. Well, it's basically the idea of uh, we live in a world of contradiction. You know, we have night and day, good and bad. You know, we have music and, and, and silence. You know, um, a lot of understanding what something is has to do with understanding what its opposite is. You know, in order for there to be a God, there has to be a devil from which you need to be saved. Or um, there's a confluence of elements to, to, to take place to, 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 uh, to make what we have as sort of a reality. It's like when people ask me something like, uh, uh, how is everything? Is everything good? No, everything is not good because if everything was good, nothing would be good. It's only because there, there, there's a struggle that there are bad things that were good. Um, now, I don't indulge negativity per se. But I also don't favor things that I think are positive. You know, there's life. And wherever you negotiate, whatever that is, you know, be true to what it is. The truth, to me, doesn't have a side. It, it doesn't have a good or bad. It is the truth. Good and bad are, are, are extremes of what, what, what there is. But it's like a volume knob. You have from zero to, to ten. You can turn it all the way up or all the way down. And then there's a gradient scale. But I think we're... We, we think linearly in this life, and life isn't linear, it's concentric. Oh, I love that line. Unpack that. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's like a tree. Rings on a tree. You know, like, like you could draw a line through those circles, you know, but the same man, you know, Nicholas at five is Nicholas at 50. He has insight into that, and Nicholas at 50 has insight into Nicholas that is five. It doesn't go from here to here. It builds upon itself when you have access to all that ring, all those rings at any point in time. I'm just trying to break away from linear thinking. Well, if you say this and that, if you say bam, then where, as a white person, as an Asian person, as a woman, as a, where am I included? I'm not saying anyone's excluded, but it's hard for us to process 
And I have more than one thing at one time, and I'm just trying to break away from that messed up thought process that if A, then B, then if we do this, then it has to be that. No, life is not like that. Life would exist in a circle, not in a line. You know, we can do whatever. We can have, we have New Year's Day every January 1st. Every time, I don't care what you're doing a year, every January 1st we say, Happy New Year. And it always comes back to one, just like the music. Us taking control of the music industry, that's what it would take. I mean, we have no TV stations, we have no radio stations. We black people, we have black, well, musicians or um, um, the great bassist Ray Brown once uh, asked the, the music community, he said, if everybody, every musician just gave a dollar, we could buy a radio station, you know. And then we could say what this music is, but we don't own anything. We have no magazines, I mean musicians, or as a race, or as music lovers, really music lovers, not people who make money off the music. I mean, the music industry, it's the only big industry, uh, industry this big, that does not have a contingency plan for the future. All they want to do is jump on. What's hot now? Okay, that's hot. Everybody do this. Okay, okay, next thing, that's hot. They don't even research what's next going to be hot. They are just taking money. And if you can uh, um, put money into building an artist, why can't you put money into building a music or building a future for the music that they're making the money out of? But it's just the one, it, it's... See, this music... <laughs> unfortunately and fortunately has a long shelf life so it's no urgency to sell this music they can wait a hundred years they can own it that's why I say we got to own something until we own something it won't happen there's no real money in the J word except for an elite few you know the house people you know, I remember when I was at Verve um, back in the 90s, and they were the biggest label at the time within the industry. And um, when the Ken Burns documentary came out, and for like a whole couple weeks or whatever, all of America was tuned into what this music is. You know, and Verve was only interested in exploiting recordings 50 years old by Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong and all this stuff. I was like, you all have an opportunity right now to say that, okay, the music came from here, but we have artists now who you can go see who are playing in your town. But it was like it was dead already. You know, look at all the festivals. Look, everything is either an all-star band, some kind of clusterfuck, or, or a tribute to someone who's dead. Why do we have to keep doing that? How can we develop any new music? If the people thought now, like they did then in 1959, we wouldn't have a record like Kind of Blue. Because now it looks like an all-star record, but at that time, no one knew who Bill Evans was. Cannonball was just a side man, Train, all those guys. Now over time, they, they, they're an all-star band. But it's like, we don't create new music that is on par with the music of, of yore because people are trying to chase something that's already been dead. And as long as the J word keeps chasing the hungry ghosts of the past, we'll never have a future or validity in today. But will the word change that? The word means everything. How can we have liberation if white people could still call you nigger? That's how I, that's how I look at it. Music should be taught in elementary school just like reading, writing, and arithmetic. Rhythm, what you can call it, if add the fourth R, call it rhythm, whatever you want to call it. But if everyone knew how to play the piano, if you had to take, just like you take a year or two of French and Spanish, and most people never get there or never use that, they would use learning how to play the piano because then they would understand music and they would know what was good and what was not good and they would reject a lot of this bullshit you hear on the radio <laughs> so that's where it's always education my, my father was a a music teacher in the same elementary school i went to and everybody in the school had to take violin and recorder all those kids now 
we all like Facebook friends or whatever, they have a sensibility of music. They're not profes professional musicians, but they have a sensibility of music that has been instilled in them. It's kind of like when every black household had a piano. It didn't matter if you were dirt poor or in the projects or whatever, you had a piano. We've lost that. And what's the first thing the government co cuts out of schools? Arts. Arts. We will fund, fund athletics and all the other stuff, but they don't, because when you, when you expose a young person to arts and creative free thinkers, they challenge the status quo, and they don't want a, a, a society of thinkers, you know, and that's really the essential problem. This is bigger than BAM or music or anything else. This is a global problem, and this is about reclaiming something as humans and individuals that we need to, or else we'll all be sheeps, you know. Here's the thing, if you ask most black people today on the street what's their favorite J-word artist, they will indelibly tell you that it's Kenny G. That's how far removed we are from what it is. But to me, he is a living embodiment of what the J-word is. He is the embodiment of the white characterization of great black music. Menstrual in reverse. Menstrualism in reverse. I, I did this gig. I did this gig out in Seattle one time with this guy. He was from Poland. He was a saxophone player. Couldn't play shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, he really couldn't. But they loved him, man, because he came out. He had sunglasses on. He had leather pants and shit, you know. And he stood around with his horn like he was just this bad motherfucker. <laughs> Couldn't play shit, but, but he was making money off of this word. That's ridiculous. Come on. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> to say that the J word is, is of the black community, no one has a problem when you say mariachi is of the Mexicans. Or, you know what I mean? We, we automatically accept that spaghetti is of the Italians. But but as but, but soon as you say the J word, other people, well, noodles are from China, but spaghetti, <laughs> the rib, derivation of the noodle. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So that's the problem. When you don't name your shit, somebody else will co opt it. That's all. I'm just trying to give proper credit. I'm not trying to exclude anybody. I just want to say this music was our pathway to freedom. It is what made um, our oppressors see that we are indeed human. My yeah. question is not so much about a dispute. My question is, do you agree that if we hold true to that as we understand that, that will eventually break the mentality that that the J word holds now? There's no goal in mind. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't say what I said to have us all here today. I just, I've been blogging about this since 09. You know, shortly after Mr. Bart's and I had a conversation at North Sea when he was playing with uh, McCoy Tyner and he was telling me about the J-word and everything sort of crystallized for me like, okay, now I get it. it, it it's the word that, that that's fucking up the music. It's not the music itself. So to me, it's not about what people do. Some people, like I said earlier, are very appropriate for that word. I'm not trying to change <laughs> iTunes. <laughs> J word at Lincoln Center or anything or anybody else, you know, do what you want to do, but I know what I'm going to do. Once again, I, 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 I'm a Libra like uh, Nicholas. <laughs> I see two sides all the time. But um, when I was growing up studying this music, I had to learn it in the street. It's a folk music, it's a street music. Now kids are learning it in school. It's an academic thing. And they are learning stuff that's been worked out for them already. We worked it out our own selves. And that's 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 what it and there's a difference if you hear. Now, the J word, I I, I teach at Oberlin Conservatory of Music. They have a J department. Of which I'm the J saxophonist professor. <laughs> now, they're making a lot of money from that word. They're making a lot of money from that word. As is Juilliard, as is Berkeley. It's part of the house system. Okay, so they're not going to be against that. I mean, for me, and I've always felt like that because over across the, the way, the other building, the, the conservatory 
um, which teaches so-called European classical music. See, it's all music to me. You can never make me see. When I listen to music, I'm listening to music. I'm not listening to a word. I, I don't listen to words. I listen to music. I don't care if it's Beethoven. I don't care if it's Fats Domino. It's music. I either like it or I don't. The, look, the, uh, the last innovation in modern music is the rhythm section. Up until, what, the early 1900s, they were marching bands. They didn't have a set of drums. They didn't have a bass and a piano. That's the, that's the latest innovation, in, innovation in music, which we gave to the world. I mean, Clue invented the hi-hat, different guys. I mean, you know, this... I, it, ultimately, I, and to answer your question, what I would call it, if you really have to have a name, because I guess you do, <laughs> Nicholas Payton's music. <laughs> Orrin Evans' music. Marcus Strickland's music. Ben Wood's music. That's what it is. Now, you want to go further, you want to go beyond that, go ahead. Right. You know, like the story I told at the beginning, we got to start here. You know, tell our friends. You know, I grew up in a house, my father uh, taught African American history for 30 years at Trenton State and Princeton University, and my mother was an opera singer and sang with opera North. So I grew up in that kind of household. But when I reunite with some of my friends that grew up on the same block in Trenton, New Jersey, they're like, oh, your mom was the one across the go, oh, and your dad had us in there. You know, it, they didn't understand that. So then what I have to do now is put it in those houses across the street. I didn't know when I was eight that I should be like, oh, you know what, this is what my dad played when we were in the car. But now we have to do that. We have to reach out to the neighbors across the street. You know, when I have my son's kids in the car, I don't care, I'm playing band. You know, uh, what is it? Oh, sorry, my son's friends. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Although, my, son, my, son, my son's friends, Lord, my son's friends in the car. You know, I'm playing black American music. Whatever that is, I'm, I'm playing music, point blank. I'm playing all types of music. You know, when they were uh, when they were little, and before Netflix and all that, I went online and bought all the movies that I grew up checking out. You know, from from Raising the Sun to Claudine. Basically, what I'm saying, and they didn't want to sit through it, but they did. You know, and it's in their head. My son, you know, just the other day, the 13 year old was telling me the whole story of Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich. That stuff I forgot. You know, about the movie. But the point is, my whole point is, we just have to start here telling each of your friends, and not your musician friends. I mean, tell your, tell your cousins, invite them out. That's how we can get back those people that we, we lost, basically. Hold I hope that answers your question. Hold on, I, I uh, I'll say one clue. Um, in the same town, at the same time, Nicholas Payton was given a clinic, okay? Now, we're in the clinic, and I don't see anybody that looks like me. Maybe it's peppered here and there throughout. Um, and they're all interested in everything except the music. And the guy I was doing the clinic with, uh, he gets asked a question. Uh, somebody says, so um, do, you, do you ever think about the audience when you're playing? Do you ever think about the people that you're playing for? Or are you just, you know, going to do what you're going to do. Um, immediately, I responded, I said, I always think of the audience. I'm not just playing for myself, this is for people. And I'm trying to go on, this guy cuts me off and says, I don't ever think of the audience. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. And then I just, something really, really started connecting. Um, I started realizing that um, we don't have to educate, we don't have to necessarily, you know, tell people this is what I'm doing and, you know, that's why you're supposed to like it. That's not, how, that's not gonna get somebody to like it. Um, what it has to do with is your reasoning, like what, 
What are you there for? Are you there to communicate to the people out there? Or are you there just to show how intellectual you are? And that's gonna get that's gonna garner a different response. Yeah. That's just a fact. Tonight has been serious discussion about roots music, mm -hmm. American roots music, mm -hmm. and the direction that it's going. And there are a lot of angles and you took on the the stance that the labels have pimped a lot of the musicians to be these different types of musicians. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, we explained it. Uh, you know, um, it's a negative word. It's a word that means nothing. And it's a word that, first of all, it's a word. Music is music. Music is not a word. You can't, some, you can't even describe music. That's why critics, that's why I don't listen hold much credence to, you know with critics because you can't talk about music it's it's subjective you know it's in the, it's in the ear of the beholder so uh, you can't name it and and to try to name it is chasing after something very elusive because what it is is music water is water air is air music is music and that's the way I see it, so, I, you know, I, no one can convince me any different. Tell me about the direction and the state of where the music is going now. It seems like there's been a dumbing down of just the masses and culture and especially history, mm -hmm. and it's affecting the, the back end of where music is going right now. Well, that's been going on for many years. It didn't just start with this generation. It's been going on since as long as, especially since recorded music, and even before recorded music, you can go back to Beethoven's time, and Beethoven had problems with his publishers. He was probably the first guy to, have, to give the same compositions to different publishers and make money off of it, you know. You know, Art Blakey used to do stuff like that, <laughs> you know. So it, it's, a, it's a, a problem that artists who, um, a medium happens to be music, have faced many years. It seems like we're going to have to take the music by the hand and guide it and nurture it like our predecessors. There you go. I mean, basically, yeah, we're, raising, we're, we're taking a baby, we're, you know, and just raising it. It's time to start this game all over again. That's how I feel. And the reason I want to start it all over again, because I want to, I, the present model isn't making it uh, as inclusive to the people that I would like to see in the audience not dismissing who is already in the audience. So I'm not saying I want to wipe the slate clean. I'm saying I need to start over to grab some other people in. And maybe that begins with this or that. And I believe it begins with, with what we're calling it first and recognizing it for what it is. Because the reason I think I have lost some of the people that I would like to see in the audience is because they don't feel any ownership on it anymore. So how can they feel ownership on it is if we call it what it is. It's theirs. You know? It's just like my last name is Evans. My, if, if I'm at the Phantom Reunion and I'm the only one that's not, you know, name Evans, I'm not going to feel included. I'm not going to feel part of the family. So what I'm trying to do is give them their, that spirit back so they're included. We're at a loss of education, history, and also our own culture right now and it's affecting everything as far as music and everything that affects us. And where do you see the direction of this? You know, it's difficult because I feel like for a lot of people, the meaning of jazz is calcified, it cannot be changed. And even if you change the name, it's, they still understand like, oh, see, some people stand on stage with some trumpets and saxophones. I see, I see, that's jazz. You can't trick me, try to sneak under the door, call into something else, that's jazz. I reject it, which is ridiculous because that's the source of some of the greatest music ever made. Perhaps the greatest music ever made. I mean, you know, when I really need to blow my mind, I go to Miles, Train, Monk, etc. You know, um, it's... You know, it's, it's, it's hard because I feel like the people have gone away from jazz and jazz has gone away from the people. And just changing the name or revivifying the name isn't 
the entirety of the problem that there is a problem with the sort of music that we're making I think Nicholas is trying to address the problem in saying this you know this cliche of the poor jazz musician is bullshit and we're not gonna do that anymore we're not gonna be that anymore um, but still gonna be tricky turning the boat you think it's time for your notes to be published now I mean because clearly you've started a movement but I think that you understand now in our generation that we have to move past president and in the future and the next set of scholars are going to have to understand what you're coming from. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it all comes down to choice. You know, I, I'm not a, I don't believe anyone has to do anything. You know, um, to me, there, there's um, um, people who are, are soldiers for truth and authenticity and those who bullshit. And that's what uh, it all basically comes down to. Quickly, why did you start BAM? I didn't start it, you know. I just said shit like I always say it. And it created itself. What is Nicholas Payton going to do? What are you going to do now as a musician and as a person and lover of the culture? What are you going to do next? I have no idea. I'm an improviser. And as an improviser, there's a comfort in not knowing what's coming next. And that's where I live. That's my address. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. Reporting live here at Birdland here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Nicholas Payton as well as Torre and all the special guest panelists on tonight's conversation on BAM, Black American Music. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.